Well, thank you, Paul. I had a little bit of help from about 3,000 other people. But, uh, um, so when Paul asked me to give this talk, I thought it would be good if I could not only speak about the Higgs boson, the LHC, but also give you some information about CERN. And CERN does have an education program, since this is a, a mostly teachers here. I thought it would be useful to do that. hope I can finish in 45 minutes. CERN General, just to let you know, CERN was founded. Can everybody hear me at the back? Yeah. CERN was founded in 1954, just after the Second World War, and it was founded on the premise of science for peace. Now we sort of use science for society instead of science for peace. Today we have 20 member states with about three other member states lining up to join within the next few years. You see the list of member states here, uh, associate member states, observer status, United States, and Japan, India, and so on. Oh, going the wrong way. Um, we have 2,300 staff. These are people who are you know, permanent staff at CERN, either on limited duration contracts or on indefinite contracts. And just under 1,000 other paid personnel, that's postdocs, students, and all sorts of other people. More importantly, we have more than 11,000 users who come from all of the universities all over Europe and the rest of the world. Budget's about a billion per year. Um, this is the one which I usually show. It's a distribution of all CERN users by nation of the Institute. It was earlier this year. And you see the blue bits, all of Europe. That CERN was start, started out to be a European organization. And you also see that uh, there are many others uh, from practically all over the world, with the exception, a little bit of exception of Africa. Um, you also see here that uh, the only um, European state, the most Western one, is not a member state of CERN. And I've been trying to do something for that, about that for 20 years and have failed miserably. And I don't think now is the time when I'm going to have any success with that. <laughs> so Ireland and CERN, this is just to put you in the picture of where Ireland is. There's no official relationship between uh, Ireland and CERN. A uh, few registered users of the CERN facilities, there are 10 scientists and engineers from Irish institutes, 23 scientists and engineers or students with Irish primary nationality. You know there's an experimental particle physics group, a very small group at UCD, which was established in 2002, and Trinity College has a theoretical physics group. Ireland has a strong interest, however, in the computing, the grid technology, and this is reflected in its membership of the cross-grid and, and the other European uh, initiative for, for the grid. So the mission of CERN is, of course, doing research. Um, now, of course, to do research, you have to do innovation. There's also education, and we also unite people. Um, so this is the, the, our, our mission. We push forward the frontiers of knowledge. For example, the secrets of the Big Bang. What was matter like in the first moments after the exist, when the universe came into existence? But in order to do this, we have to develop new technologies for accelerators and detectors, uh, we, and also for information technology. You all know the World Wide Web was invented at CERN. The grid was uh, invented in preparation for the data for the LHC. We also have used uh, the accelerators and the detectors for medical applications. For example, we have designed uh, low energy, uh, if you like, very small LHCs, which are very effective for cancer therapy using protons or car carbon ions. Instead of cutting the tumor out, you can you can zap it with a, with a particle beam, which uh, is much less invasive and much more effective. And we also use the fact that when the beam hits the tumor, that we use the same techniques for detecting that the beam has hit the tumor and what's happening. So that those sort of things uh, are uh, spin-offs of what we've been doing. The other thing which um, people probably don't realize is the incredible number of scientists and engineers are trained at CERN. To give you an example, one experiment, ATLAS, has 1,200 PhD students, uh, and there are four experiments at CERN, and then there's CERN as well. So it's an incredible, we have a lot of training programs as well, which I'll go through. The other thing is that we unite people from different countries and different cultures, and I think this is extremely important. On the right, you've just seen, this is the CERN summer student program. This year we had more than 200 students from 70 different countries. So there's, we even have the situation where Israelis act, Israeli funds pay for a Palestinian student to do work, so we have nice uh, examples of things like that. This is the education, and probably the most interesting thing for you here is the bottom right. There is a CERN teachers, 
teacher school where we teach physics teachers how to teach physics. If, so, <laughs> properly. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the new physics, I mean. Uh, we also have a student physics student program, uh, summer student program, and we have young researchers. There's a high energy physics school, school of computing, uh, school of accelerator studies. And we also go all over the world. There's an academic training program and so on. Now, just to let you know that the teacher's training program, um, this is not restricted to you know, member states. The CERN, you see here the distribution of the people who actually took, took part in these. And there's a large number coming from non-member state countries. And there were actually three. I hadn't realized this. You see there's three in a box there on Ireland in the red in the bottom middle. OK, so now get on to the real subject. Um, why do we do all this? And this is the history of the universe. Uh, and you see it starts at, um, if you like, at time zero. Uh, and, well, the numbers here are very small. It hasn't reached zero yet. I use this new pen. Thank you. That works. So this is time, this is temperature, and this is energy. And the, the whole thing started with the Big Bang. And there's a very, very logarithmic scale here. We've been around for something like 13 billion years. We're here now. And in this time, as a, as, a, as a function of time, particles existed which no longer exist. They decayed into other particles, and the whole thing changed. It's been going on for 13 billion years. The temperature started at temperatures of 10 to the 32 Kelvin, pretty hot. Uh, going now, we're almost at zero Kelvin, 2.7 Kelvin in the universe. Uh, and the more important parameter here is the energy in the system. And we measure this in giga electron volts. That's 10 to the 9 electron volts. And basically, what we do is we work on this scale, and we accelerate particles. We increase the energy of particles. So we accelerate them along this line. And in so doing, we get closer and closer to the instant of the creation of the universe. And if you look where we are now with the LHC, we're at about a millionth of a millionth of a second after uh, the creation of the universe. And that's what we do. We, we examine what happens in this, in this region of time or temperature or energy. So basically, by accelerating these particles to higher and higher energies and colliding them, we recreate, and it's a very, very small controlled way, the conditions which existed just after the creation of the universe. The higher the particle energy, the closer we get to the instant of the Big Bang. And that's very important to understand. That's the whole reason for what we're doing. Now, this is not new. It's been going on for the last 80 or 90 years. And this shows you the progress in a logarithmic scale. There are something like 12 orders of magnitude here along this line in energy over the last 80 or 90 years. And these are all the accelerator which, accelerators which have been built and done physics. And the way in which we've been operating this is in order to keep this curve going at this high rate, we um, this comes about through the use of new technologies. And what happens is uh, the progress is achieved through repeated jumps uh, from saturating technologies to emerging technologies. And the most recent one was superconductivity. And you see that all of the recent accelerators, the very high energy accelerators in the last 15 or 20 years, have used superconductivity in some form or other. So I guess not everybody knows what a particle accelerator is, but I, I think it's on some syllabus now for, for in the UK. Um, I'll not go through the whole thing here, but a particle accelerator, first of all, by its name, it provides a beam of energetic particles to study the structure of matter. They have to circulate in a vacuum chamber because if they collide with re residual uh, gas molecules, they'll self-destruct. Uh, they employ electrical fields in their direction of motion so as to accelerate them to higher and higher energies. They uh, employ transverse fields in the opposite direction, in the transverse direction to their motion, which steer them on the circle, if you want to do that, or focus them. So the focusing is by quadrupoles, which is like the lens in your camera. It focuses the, the particle beams. And then you collide them. And to do that, you either collide them with a fixed target, or you collide two beams together, which is much more effective. This is a uh, very short plan or schematic of the number of accelerators in CERN and the dates in which they were commissioned. We have 12 accelerators all together. And the LHC is the last, but every one of these other accelerators has to be working before the LHC will work because 
the energy is cascaded. You start with zero energy. Each accelerator increases the energy by about a factor of 20. And then you go to the next one, the next one, and you extract from one accelerator into the next. And uh, you see from this that we started, the biggest one which is still operating, it's too small here to see, but the PS started in 1959. It's still operating perfectly at CERN. Uh, and it's giving pulses every one second to all of the accelerators at CERN. So the principal components, again, uh, uh, these are the principal components of a particle accelerator. You see the copper colored things because cavities used to always be made of copper, now they're superconducting. Uh, these are cavities which give an electric field in the direction of motion of the particle. So as the particle is going around in this huge circle, it gives it a kick in that direction, which inc increases its energy. The blue things are the focusing magnets, which focuses the beams uh, as it goes around, and the white things bend the, the particles on the circle. So that's the main things you need. You also need a vacuum chamber, you need somewhere to collide them, and you need to inject, and I'll show you later, you need also to abort or extract the beam as well. Um, how does the detector work? Um, this is a very simple, de detectors are incredibly complicated instruments, enormous instruments, I'll show you some of the later. Um, but basically, it's like a, a big onion ring. Um, starting at the center, uh, the yellow part here, this is what we call a tracking detector. This measures the charge and the momentum of any charged particle, and it measures them in a magnetic field. There's usually a strong magnetic field, a solenoid field, going through the page. Uh, uh, the green bit is the electromagnetic calorimeter. This measures the energy of electrons, positrons, and photons. And the orangey colored thing is the hadronic calorimeter, which measures the energy of the hadrons. Hadrons can be protons, neutrons, pions. So you want to measure the properties of all the particles which are generated in this uh, 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang, You want because you don't know what's happening, so you want to measure everything. Uh, and then on the blue bits on the outside are the muon detectors. They measure the charge and the momentum of the muons. And when you add all this up, and if it doesn't add up in terms of energy, you assume that the rest is caused by neutrinos, so you can reconstruct any given event. These things happen, for example, the Higgs decays into other particles in 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Uh, so they have to be fast. So in order for us to build these accelerators and detectors, the amount of engineering, and this is something which hasn't been understood for some time, hasn't been promoted for some time, but CERN is basically an, an, an enormous engineering endeavor rather than, I mean, we need to do physics, but what we have to do is build things, which means engineering. And these are the, the, the branches of engineering which we use on large scales. Civil engineering, survey, um, electrical distribution, cooling and ventilation, cryogenics, magnets, both room temperature and superconducting. Power converters, because you have to take the AC mains power, make it DC to feed the coils of the magnets. Ultra high vacuum for the particles to go around. Radio frequency, these are the high frequency acceleration system which accelerates the particles, both room temperature and superconducting. Of course, we have to measure all the properties of the beam, that's beam diagnostics and instrumentation. We have to control the whole thing. There's beam feedback because there's an incredible number of electromagnetic instabilities which we have to study and then provide feedback against. And of course, you have to inject and extract. This needs fast, powerful ferrite kicker loaded magnets. Machine protection, that's about the only subject which I'll give you a little bit more information on. And there's targets, dumps, and collimators. When you dump this beam, it has an incredible amount of energy, and no one knows how to absorb the energy in it. So we had to build a very long uh, composite carbon beam dump surrounded by uh, concrete and steel, and it's 600 meters underground on tangentially to the machine because it would just destroy almost anything that hits in the way. So I'll... I'll now I move on to the LHC. This is the LHC looking towards the, the French Alps. And you, I hope you can see the red ring. This is the LHC. Uh, it's a superconducting proton accelerator and collider. It's installed in a 27 kilometer circumference underground tunnel. The cross section of the tunnel is around four meters. The tunnel was built in 1985 for a previous machine which I was responsible for called LEP, Large Electron Positron Collider. Uh, and this is the tunnel which was built in 1985. And this tunnel, the LEP, the Large Electron Positron, was decommissioned in 2000 in order to allow us to install the LHC in 2001 onwards. This just shows you an aerial photograph of the Geneva area uh, with the, the ring on top of it. 
Uh, and this is the one I like best. This is the Da Vinci version of it. So one of our Italian friends did this uh, with lots of other things. So this shows you the same sort of plot, but you see on the bottom right, this is looking inside the tunnel, the four meters with the superconducting magnets. Uh, this is the Atlas detector, CMS detector, LHCB detector, and Alice. I don't know if you can see the Atlas detector, but this is a person here, this little dot. Um, and this atlas, the cavern in which atlas has been placed, it's, it's 100 meters underground, it's about the size of a six-story building. This was during this, the civil engineering, not very interesting, but to give, give you a feel of how dirty it can be and how clean it is afterwards. So, and this was CMS. We started building this vertical shaft, and the walls kept caving in because of the water. So we had to actually freeze the, the, the ground all around, down to 50 meters, and then make the shaft, and then make do the concreting and then uh, unfreeze it. This is inside the tunnel. This is the uh, so-called cryoline, helium distribution. Along this big line is the, the helium distribution goes around to 27 kilometers and this is at uh, minus 271 centigrade. Um, and this feeds the magnets, keeps the magnets cold. This is something which uh, you'll see later was part of the problem. This is an interconnect. We have all these magnets they have to be brought down and installed, but then they have to be connected up together because they're all fed mostly in series. So this is an interconnect, and you see it's rather complicated mechanically. You need continuity um, for the vacuum. You need continuity for electrical distribution. You need continuity for the beam. And when you cool all this thing down, the whole ring shrinks by 80 meters, 80 meters. So it all, these all things have to slide. So these interconnects are incredibly complicated because they have to take up this slack. Uh, now, if you want to, I won't go into very much detail because it, it, you could have a week's conference on this. Um, basic parameters of the LHC, the beam energy, that's the first thing. We wanted to have an energy around 7 TV per beam, which is something like seven times higher than any other machine, uh, whichever had been built. And we knew the radius of the tunnel from the LEP days. So this meant that we had to build magnets were 8.3 Tesla, which means superconducting magnets. Normal magnets won't go above 1.8 Tesla, so they saturate the, 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 magnet, the magnetic material saturate. So the LHC circumference is, is 26.7 kilometers. The cooling for the, for the superconducting magnets needs 40 megawatts of, of electrical power. But if we had not gone to superconductivity, we would have had to build a tunnel with a circumference of 100 kilometers, and it would have used a gigawatt of power. So we would have needed a nuclear power station to run the thing. So it, we had to do this. Uh, now, these are some of the parameters of the LHC. I've already mentioned the circumference, and it's 100 to 150 meters underground. The number of dipoles, are these big blue things, which are 15 meters long. Um, each one of them cost a million Swiss francs. Um, and the, these use uh, niobium titanium cables, um, and there's 37 million kilograms of material which is at 1.9 Kelvin. 37 million kilos. Uh, the length of the dipole, the dipole is 8.4, operating temperature 1.9. This is interesting because at 1.9, helium is superfluid. Superfluid means that it's no resistance to flow, it just, it, it's a beautiful coolant. Um, current in the dipoles, this is a big problem because this is 13,000 amperes. In order to make this field, you have to put in these little coils 13,000 amperes. Uh, and you need to convert from AC power to DC, and you can't have any r residual ripple. So, and you also need one part per million resolution. Otherwise, there are nonlinear instabilities which occur from, for various reasons. This was, was one of our worries in red. Um, the other two things which are very interesting is that with all of this current flowing in the coils and the inductance of the coils and so on, there's an incredible amount of stored energy. And it's 1.1 gigajoules per octant. So eight octants in the machine, 1.1 gigajoules per octant. And when the beam is actually circulating, it has a total uh, stored energy in the beam itself. You're, I remind you that the beam at the, at the cross sections, at the point where it interacts, is of the same transverse size as a human hair. So it's very, very small, but it has 360 megajoules of, of energy. Uh, so I wanted to 
give you an idea, because I'll talk a little about machine protection and what went wrong in, in 2008. Um, so the, as I said before, the energy stored in the magnets is uh, 1.1 gigajoules per octant, or more or less 10 gigajoules total. 10 gigajoules is the same energy which an aircraft carrier traveling at full battle speed has. It has the same energy as the energy stored in these magnets. And if we have a problem, and by a problem I mean if the magnets get suddenly heated up a little bit because you know, there's been some friction or some particles have hit them and warmed them up, we need to detect that, and I'll, I'll go into that later, and then we need to extract the energy in 40 seconds. So we have to stop this uh, Nimitz-class aircraft carrier in, in the equivalent of 40 seconds. Uh, even probably more dangerous is the beam itself, because I said before the beam has 362 megajoules, has a lot less total energy than the, the, the stored magnetic energy. But it's, it's a very, very, the energy density is incredibly high because the cross-section of the beam is so, and nobody knows what an 8 TeV beam will do if it hits materials because nobody's ever had an 8 TeV beam before. The other interesting thing is when you dump this beam, and you, you know that power is the rate of change of energy, uh, when we dump it for just under uh, 100 microseconds, there's four terawatts of power. And that's the total electrical uh, generation of the planet. Uh, where am I? So the other thing which I used to still have nightmares about is that if you take the 362 megajoules and you, from your high school, calculate for, for a metal like copper or, or whatever you like, I take copper as an example, melting point of copper, the specific heat capacity of copper, the latent heat of fusion, and so on. You can easily work out that 362 megajoules would melt 500 kilos of copper. So if this beam gets loose, it'll just um, make a very thin long hole. <laughs> and I would be out of a job. There's no doubt about that. So we have, we have systems. And so how do we deal with this self-destructive power? Clearly, what you have to do uh, is you dissipate this power, you transfer it to a safe place, and you dissipate it in this safe place. Now, we have two protection systems. This is the only technical bit I'll go into. The magnet protection system. Magnet protection system protects the magnets, obviously. Now, quench means that the resistance, which should be zero for superconducting materials, starts to increase. When the resistance starts to increase, because the temperature has increased a little bit, and of course, as the resistance starts increased, and the 13,000 amperes is flowing through this non-zero resistance, then it heats it more, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an avalanche effect. So what we do is we measure the resistance on all of, them, all of the magnets, and if we see any increase in the resistance, we have a, a system which dumps the energy into a big bank of resistors in the tunnel that makes a large noise, and, and everything gets very hot for a little while, but we've saved the rest of the machine. The more complicated thing is what we call the machine protection, because any single element on that 27 kilometers which turns off or doesn't behave properly or is not controlled properly can cause the beam to be lost, become unstable. And then the beam will make this long, thin hole, which I, I mentioned. So every single critical element, and there are thousands of them, are equipped with a sort of emergency abort signal. If something goes wrong with this piece of equipment, it sends a signal to abort the beam. So you, you actually dump the beam. And the way we dump the beam is we have these very fast uh, switching magnets, which is another technology which, uh, which had to be developed by us. And that actually, when the beam's going around in a circle, it gives a kick and the beam goes tangentially straight down a 600 meter um, tunnel and it ends up in the beam dump. But even, that, even though we've designed this composite carbon beam dump, we have to spray the beam out on the front of the beam dump because even on this, it would reach 6,000 centigrade and, and fracture several meters inside. So that's the safety system. And um, so September 10, 2008, it worked. We got it going. We got the beam going round and every, all the journalists and so on. I spent the whole day with the BBC. Everybody was in the control room. You could hardly, you see all the microphones hanging. You couldn't get walking in the control room for television crews. And it all worked and worked extremely well, much better than anybody could have anticipated. 
Eight days later, there was a new management proposed by the Director General, the new Director General who's taking over. He proposed his new management structure for 2009 to 2013. This was on the 18th, remember, the 10th we started up the machine. And this was all agreed. And I was nominated as the Director of Acceleration Technology responsible for this machine and all the other machines. And 19 hours later, <laughs> uh, I don't think they made the right decision. 19 hours later, we had this accident where basically what happened was the, the, one of the protection systems didn't work. So one intermagnet connector, there are 100,000 of them, but one was badly soldered. It was worse than badly soldered. It was not soldered. And the magnet protection system didn't protect. And we had this beautiful machine which had just been running for a few days. And these things are aligned to you know, microns, but it's not aligned to microns after the accident. Um, this is the beautiful interconnects. They, they've been crushed together. Uh, this is the electrical arc which developed with all the this was a fraction of the total energy, by the way. Uh, this was the collateral damage. Uh, anyway, I, it's a bit depressing for me to look at that, so I'll move on to it. <laughs> the other thing that happened was the magnets were pulled off their anchor points uh, because when the, well, what happened was this resistance went up, and of course it got hotter and hotter, and then it melted uh, the interconnect, and then we had a spark because of all the energy, it's just like an electrical, electrical spark. And then the spark burnt out everything its way and got longer and longer. And then the spark found somewhere closer, which it could go to. So it, it, like a lightning, it just hit the nearest mountain. The nearest mountain was a helium enclosure, which is at 1.9. The helium suddenly finds itself at 270 degrees hotter. So it goes and it pushed all the magnets off there. Um, uh, and then it went to the vacuum. The vacuum was at I don't know if you know anything about vacuum technology, but it was a minus 12 tar, 10 to the minus 12 millibars. So it just went and sucked in all the debris and all the mess that was there, the suit and everything. So, so we had a bit of a clean-up job on our hands afterwards. So what, then we started the repair, so I had a different mandate from what I, I thought I was going to have. We had 14 quadrupole magnets. Each of these magnets, these ones are 15 meters. And of course, all the magnets had been put in place, had been hooked up with the interconnects, but now we had to get the, 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 the cutters out, cut them out, bring them up to the surface, see what was wrong with them, test them, redo the whole testing, fix them, then bring them back down for each one. So we had to do that for 14 quadrupoles, 39 dipoles, uh, and all 54 interconnects were completely damaged. Four kilometers of vacuum had sucked in all this debris. Uh, the, um, longitudinal restraining system had to be redesigned because th that it turned out that this was badly designed. The other thing was that when the helium did get punctured, there are pressure, you know, on your, like in your pressure cooker, there's a pressure relief valve which should go just flop and stop the pressure building up. These had been underdimensioned. Worst of all, the uh, magnet protection system uh, didn't protect. So we had to redesign a new system. 6,500 new detectors, 250 kilometers of cables had to be relayed during this time. And we designed a new system which was 3,000 times more sensitive and we needed to do that. Um, in 14 months, we got all that back together. It should be remembered that what we did was repair, but there was another problem which became apparent at the same time, which would not allow us, even after the repair, to go to the full design energy. We decided we would uh, compromise, do a repair, which would allow us to go to a lower energy, which is 7 to 8 TeV, and that's what we've done. Okay, now on to the good part. Um, 14, after 14 months in November 2009, we tested the machine and it worked, and then we, we, we did some more testing for higher energy. We did first collisions at 7 TeV, uh, center of mass, at the end of March, and these are the first four uh, events which came uh, from the four experiments. And everybody was extremely happy once again. Um, very low luminosity. I'll speak about luminosity. Luminosity is the number of events per second that, you, that the experiments can measure. Integrated luminosity is the number of events over a year, over a week. So, so it's, this is the rate at which, and there are numbers like 10 to the 27. We start up, we're now at 7 times 10 to the 33. So we're a factor of uh, 7 million higher than uh, March 2010. Uh, performance in 2010, of course, we were 
quite conservative in the beginning after what had happened. We didn't want to have the same accident all over again. You see, we started around March here, the end of March, and there's all this time we didn't get much. This is peak luminosity, the luminosity which I mentioned, and then you see the red dots, the luminosity going up. We'd set ourselves a goal here of this number 10 to the 30. Here it's 10 to the 30, 30, but multiply by 100, 10 to the 32. Uh, and we reached just over two times that goal. This was you know, considered a really major achievement after what had happened. This is the integrated luminosity, which tells you the number of total number of events which the detectors will have. And uh, there, are, just remember this number, 45, it's inverse Pico Barnes. That was the number which we did in the totality of 2010. And we were the happiest people in the world, I can tell you, uh, at the end. Then we went into 2011. And 2011, we set ourselves a goal of 1,000 as opposed to the 45, so more than 20 times more. And this was the goal. And this is the luminosity in Atlas and CMS, and we reached six times the goal. And this is the luminosity in LHCB. LHCB cannot, cannot swallow the high luminosity, so it has to artificially reduce it. So they, this is the maximum which they can do. So we had a brilliant year in, in 2011. Uh, we also do collisions of lead ions, so lead ions against lead ions instead of protons against protons. We typically do this at the end of each year. And here you have the blue dots of the performance for 2011, and the red line is the maximum we achieved in 2010 for the rate per second and the integrated rate. And you see we went up by about a factor of 20 there as well. So at the beginning of this year, we have an annual retreat where we go to Chamonix in, in, the, in the French Alps. And we come out with uh, the program for the year. And the major, pro the major priority this year was we said that LHC must produce enough integrated luminosity to allow satellite Atlas and CMS to independently discover the Higgs boson by, by the end of this running period because we're going into a long shutdown after this running period in order to repair properly those interconnects so we can go to uh, 14 TV per beam. And then I, I made a stuck my neck out, or stuck the management's neck out, and this is a plot of the predicted integrated luminosity as a function of day of the week over the whole year. I mean, this is, could be suicide to do that if it doesn't work. Uh, so this was what we said. The, we also calculated that we needed this amount of integrated luminosity in order to discover the Higgs. And since this was so critical for the year, we put on a few breakpoints. We said that if we arrive here in June, the end of June, and we haven't got enough, you know, the, the, the real plot is way below, then we have to check if we're on, on track. Uh, and then if we're not, we have the possibility to extend the run by a few months. That was the idea. But it didn't happen like that. And this was what we hoped would happen. We would get this Higgs ban. Um, so the performance in 2012, to give you an idea, um, someone was mentioning the distance uh, that the, the particles travel from these um, sunspots. These protons are going at the speed of light. And in this run, they went round the LHC for 23 hours, which is a little bit further than anywhere you could ever think of going. Um, so this is the luminosity as a function of time. And the luminosity started at this fairly high number, 6 times 10 to the 33, stays in the machine for 23 hours, and produces an integrated luminosity, which is 238 inverse picobarns. What you can notice, because I mentioned in the beginning, in 2010, we had a number which was 45. In this fill, we did 45 inverse Google barns in two and a half hours, which was the same as the totality of 2010. So we're now producing uh, really, really uh, uh, lots and lots of events. This shows you, uh, just so you get a feed for it, the luminosity is a function of time over a week. And each of these sort of gray things is... Uh, particles colliding in the machine. We start with this number six, something's gone wrong here. Technically, something has dumped a beam. Some of these elements has triggered a, a beam dump, as I said, for the protection system. Then we, we refill. Then this one didn't last too long, likewise. Then we get one which lasts longer, and so on and so forth. And some of them have been pretty long. And this produced a, the, the best week uh, so far. And this was, the, uh, this, this was my blue plot, which I, I stuck my neck out for, and this was the, where we thought we needed. When we came to the first break point, this was the, in, this was the real measured integrated luminosity. And you see, we started off slowly, and then we got the rate going, and we were right on, on, on track. And this was the 4th of July just here, 
and there was a Melbourne um, High Energy Physics Conference, which is the big one of the year, and we got the results, and there we had the famous five sigma from CMS, and five sigma from Atlas. So my conclusion from all of this was that this was an overestimate. They actually did the job with, with half the luminosity, because basically what happened is they put about a thousand young physicists, let them loose on the data, and they just tore everything apart, and everything. They, they got the data out much, much faster than they thought. This is a Higgs event from Atlas. It's a Higgs event. You'll see some of this later with four muons and the blue, blue tracks of the muons. This is this enormous detector, which is um, 40 meters long and 25 meters in diameter. OK, I, this is where we are at the moment. Peak luminosity against time. And you see what we, we've, we've gone up fairly quickly. We had a great run there. We had a little bit of a setback here. And now we're operating very high again. In daily integrated luminosity. Uh, integrated luminosity in Atlas, and we've reached, uh, you'll see it here, the goal for this year was 15, we've just touched it, we've still got something like nine weeks to go. I just say if I were a banker, I would be richer. Uh, so this is something called the pileup, and the, when, when the, the bunches of protons collide, um, Normally, what you want is one proton to collect, collide with one proton, and then you get one event in the center of the detector, which you can reconstruct. Uh, everybody was very worried about the LHC because the design was for 19, that there, were, there would be 19, on average, 19 protons which collide, which make a, a mess in the middle of it. And here you see that um, with 25 independent vertices, so these are all protons colliding with protons, the detectors are still able to differentiate all these tracks and get the right verdicts. Now, this is done with 25. I've seen one three days ago where they've done it for 76. And this is just amazing because certain accelerators in the past, there was a big machine called SSC in the United States, which was stopped. Uh, they limited their design luminosity so that they could have uh, one proton proton event per collision. And now we're operating at 76. This is the new schedule. It's just a, we, we, we redid the schedule because of the Higgs, and now we've got about nine weeks to go. Uh, I'm not going too long about the future, just to tell you that we're going to take time out for about two years, repair these defectuous interconnects, consolidate all, we have a new design for the interconnects, and finish off a lot of the work which we have to finish off. Whoops. Uh, this is just to show you that we know how to plan things, and this, this plan is over. <laughs> if you see anything wrong with it, let me know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and we get back in uh, November, end of 2014, and then we hope to get the machine running at the highest energy at the beginning of 2015 again. Uh, okay, this is tell you, I'll not go through all this. This is, you can have a look at this. We also had a, a spectacular event just before I came here. Um, we had protons colliding with lead ions. We thought we could never do that, but it, it worked way, way, way ahead of schedule. Uh, this is where we are now, so this is the predicted. And we're now up, as you see here. And of course, since the schedule, we should have stopped here. That's why it's flat, because we changed the schedule. So I just put on the new schedule, and it's, it's right on, on track. By the way, the, the five signal, which was announced on the 4th of July, they've just, re, they've just redone the, the data analysis. And now Atlas are up at six sigma. For those of you who don't know, six sigma means there's one chance in a 1,000 million that they're wrong. So it's pretty sure um, you've got two experiments which are finding the same thing. So this is a, a new party. So summary, I, I have three summaries, one on CERN, one on LHC, and one on the Higgs. So just to remind you again, what we do at CERN is study what happened immediately after the Big Bang. I've said that twice already. We're seeking answers to questions about the fundamental building blocks of the universe and the forces that control them. For example, what's the origin of mass? But in order to do this research, we also have to advance the frontiers of technology, and I've shown you some of those. We also train thousands of young physicists and engineers, and we bring nations and cultures together through science. LHC, LHC accelerates protons to very high energies and collides them. These collisions produce new particles which only existed a millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. The properties of these short-lived particles are measured by the detectors. 
And this way, I say it again, we reproduce in a very small way the conditions which existed just after the instant of creation of the universe. But it's also worthwhile to point out that it was and is an enormous engineering endeavor to construct and operate the LHC and the detectors. And the LHC has provided and still provides huge technology transfers to our contractors because everything we do, we, tr we train the con contractors how to do it and they use it afterwards. Higgs, on July 4th, 2012, Atlas and CMS announced the discovery of a new particle, and they say consistent with the Higgs boson. They're still not sure it is a Higgs boson. The Higgs field is a mediator of mass and explains the origin of mass in the universe. With, now, without the Higgs force, there would be no mass, and without mass, the universe as we know it would not exist. I think the Higgs discovery is probably the most significant physics event, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, and with this discovery, we start a new era of physics using the LHC for the next 20 years or so. It's just the beginning of an incredibly exciting uh, time for, for science and physics. And I'll just show you, uh, on the 4th of July, there was a seminar at CERN, uh, and there were, the CERN auditorium holds about 450 or 500 people. And I've taken one minute of the, the video record of it just to try to give you some sort of idea of what the uh, um, atmosphere was like. <coughs> this is the five sigma. He's just showing this. This is Joe in Candela. You can see me sitting there. This guy was incredibly nervous. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, if there are questions, uh, I can answer them. But while you're thinking about questions, I'll show you some Higgs events uh, as they're reconstructed, if it works. <coughs> so please think of some questions. This is very short. I show this in the ESOF as well, but not the Higgs. We didn't have the then. <laughs> So these blue events are the Higgs which are coming out and the two bunches collide with each other instantly and then the particles are generated, the detector detects them and they are reconstructed. This will stop in a moment. So, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I had a transparency on that. I'll, I'll show you. 50 years is the quick answer, but uh, if I have it here. Th this was the first proposal for the LHC, and you can see it was, we didn't even have computers hardly in those days. 1983, if you look at the right. I wrote this with my ex-boss, Wolfgang Schnell, who's now deceased. We wrote it in 1983 while we were building LEP, so it was 30 years ago. 
uh, that's the, the paper. And here you see the 1983 going to 2035, so it's about a 50-year adventure. So I'm getting my grandchildren to get interested in physics. So <laughs> I thought I explained it, and I end there. So, uh, I think you should have a seminar from a theoretical physicist, and then, then you'll be even more confused. <laughs> well, it's the mediator of mass. I mean, otherwise, there's no. I mean, the standard model. You know, we spent 12 years in the slip machine, um, showing that the standard model was a fantastic physics model for explaining everything. Um, but the standard model could not explain mass, and we know there is mass. Um, so the Higgs field as proposed in 1964 for, as a mediator of mass. And this field permeates the whole of the universe. And that's where the mass comes from. It's, it's, if you like, as particles are going through this field, they sort of get slowed down. If you're, if you're swimming through, through water, you get slowed down. And you, 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 that gives the mass to you. And that's the, that's the explanation. That's what it is. And with, as I said in the last slide, without this explanation, we couldn't explain mass. And without mass, the, there would only be particles traveling at the speed of light, and there would, we wouldn't be here. But again, I'm an accelerator guy that uh, builds these machines rather than tries to explain the results of them. I, I think it's, it's a fantastic story. And, and even when it, it didn't go, go right and you had the accident, we still had the determination to make it work. We so, had to. Yeah. Uh, once again, we thank Steve. For <laughs>